Um, there is a great deal of upset, uh, there always is at the moment, when it comes to education and curriculums. Um, this government's been in charge for uh, five and a half years, and um, in that time, in that five and a half years, the, um, um, the way in which we are taught uh, and uh, the declining educational standards that are measured internationally anyhow have become a hot topic for many of us. I don't think there's a parent in New Zealand who isn't concerned to a greater or lesser degree um, as to the quality of education that their children are receiving currently, exacerbated and made much worse, of course, by everything that happened during COVID and the ongoing damage caused from the reaction to that. Um, well, um, one of... They're not going to get any um, pacification from those thoughts at all. Uh, in terms of shock over the leaked draft of a science curriculum, which our next guest, I think, might have played a bit of a role in. Um, that's the new senior fellow at the New Zealand Initiative, um, Dr. Michael Johnston, um, where he is also the Associate Dean Academic in the School of Education at Victoria University, and he joins us now. Michael, welcome to the show. Good morning. Uh, I'm no longer the Associate Dean at Victoria University. I, I left that role 18 months ago. I've been at the initiative ever since. I was just going to say that would be uh, quite interesting because you'd be, you'd be in two, have two masters, wouldn't you, really, if that was the case? <laughs> yes, well, I, I'm here to serve education. That's my, my role. Is that one of the reasons you resigned from Victoria University? Oh, uh, well, there's a, there's a bunch of reasons that uh, the university was no longer as attractive as it used to be. Uh, and now we're seeing a, a bunch of cuts there. But I think you want to talk about the science curriculum this morning. I do, I do, but I'm always interested in the people I'm talked to and what motivates them because that often has something to do with what they think as well. So that's why I asked the sure. question. Yeah. Um, yes. Now, I mean, I think the university has become le less hospitable to uh, the the contest of ideas, which is what I think it was. That's its core mission. So I I, I got a bit uh, tired of that and decided to go somewhere where I could have better conversations with colleagues. I guess. <laughs> no. Fair enough. Um, now you have been prominent though, in I think uh, you might. Did you get the original leak, Michael, um, of the draft curriculum? Yeah, it was sent to me by a by a teacher who who had received it from the ministry for what they call fast feedback, and uh, he was sufficiently concerned that he decided a bit of publicity was in order, so he sent it on to me. And now this has gone um, throughout uh, secondary chemistry educators in particular. I see Logan Park's yep. high school uh, head of um, uh, science, uh, Murray Thompson, has also come out very strongly in support of what you're saying as well. Um, now, just take us through it. We, in the past, we have taught, and I was just giving my um, pennies worth on chemistry, physics, and um, biology, not my better school days, I have to say, but they were the sort of bedrocks of the science curriculum, weren't they? Why are those three actually the bedrock of the science curriculum? Yeah, I mean, that's a reasonable question. I guess they cover uh, pretty much all of the things we might think of in science. We could add earth and space science, of course, which is now part of our curriculum. And that's arguably uh, physics and a bit of chemistry as well. Mm. Uh, but, you know, if we think about biology, that covers the living world. If we think about chemistry, that covers the, the composition of matter. And if we think about physics, that, that covers the way in which matter works in interaction with itself, if, if you will. So it, between those things, they cover quite a lot of, of the ground and science. But actually, you could add some other things like experimental psychology, which is my, my own field. There are other scientific areas, and to some extent, uh, it's historical. Right. Um, but nevertheless, it seems to have done its job over the years and produced literally legions of scientists as well. Um, now the new, and, yeah. and now the new science curriculum or the new draft is going to be taught through what it says four contexts, the earth system, whatever that is, biodiversity, food, energy and water and infectious diseases. Now, yep. what's wrong with that? Um, can't you put physics, chemistry and biology into those four ca categories as well? Well, of course, you you could put them in, and and I imagine good science teachers will as they as they approach each topic. But I mean, there's a number of problems with doing it this way. Probably the most fundamental is that the core science concepts won't be taught systematically. 
So, I mean, if you take the first of those categories you, or topics you mentioned, uh, Earth systems, uh, my reading of the document is that that's mostly climate change. Now, if you take climate change as a topic, you've got to understand carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Why is it a greenhouse gas? Because it's denser than a, a, other, a lot of other gases in the, in the atmosphere. To understand why it's denser, you have to understand atomic theory. And atomic theory has to be taught systematically from from the ground up. You you can't just throw in bits and pieces from it. It's got to be understood systematically. Same goes in physics with things like mechanics and gravitation and optics and and those key ways of understanding and organising knowledge about the nat natural world. And another thing is that if we the, these topics are, are supposed to be taught at every year level from the beginning of school through the year 13. Not only will that get a bit boring, coming back to the same topics year after year, mm. but also kids might get the idea that that's what science is and that's all there is to it. Uh, if you're not teaching the fundamental concepts and if you're not going any wider than these four topics. Um, the um, uh, 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 One of the originals or authors of this, uh, a woman by the name of... Um you, uh, Kathy Bunting, um, who yeah. is the director of the uh, Institute of e Educational Research at the University of Waikato, she's rubbished suggestions that key areas of physics and chemistry would not be taught, but she has said that we need to engage with the quote-unquote big issues of our time and that the document mm. or the new curriculum is intended to encourage change. Um, can I just ask the obvious question? Was there a problem with the teaching of science or with the curriculum? Because other research that I've read, uh, Michael, would suggest that one of the reasons that science has been taught inexpertly, particularly in our primary and intermediate schools, is because the people who are teaching it don't like the subject. Or, or they don't understand it. I, I mean, very few primary school teachers have science degrees mm. and there isn't much in you know, teacher training that gives them the content knowledge they would need to teach it well. It's not their fault, it's just not been uh, trained. They've not been trained to do it. So that that is an issue. With specialist uh, science teachers at secondary school, you know, a science degree has fairly lucrative options and, you know, unless you're really committed to being a teacher, uh, you probably won't go into it. And certainly a curriculum like this is not going to attract good scientists to be to teaching. I'm not being nasty, but I have to be honest with you. Um, the people who taught science to me at school, and I mean, you always go back to your own personal anecdotal uh, heritage, were not the most engaged individuals on the planet. They weren't the most creative. Mm -hmm. They weren't the most enthusiastic um, in comparison to, say, the liberal arts that were being taught in a school. Is that one of the reasons why science has taken a bit of a back step in secondary schools? You're getting the wrong people oh, teaching? No, I, I, I think there are, there, are, there are great science teachers out there and there are some probably fairly, uh, probably some fairly mediocre ones as well. And I think the same is probably true of any subject. I think the thing with science is that it's a fairly steep learning curve, if you will. The, 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 the concepts are multi-layered. You kind of learn one thing and then you build on top of that and then you build on top of that. Same is true of mathematics. So they, they're intellectually challenging subjects. And I'm not saying the humanities are not, but the structure of the knowledge is a bit different uh, and it's perhaps more accessible more easily. Now, Professor Elizabeth Rata, who you know um, uh, from Auckland University, um, head of, um, or she was the head of the education department there, makes the point that you've got to have basic building blocks before you can start to expand into creative and so-called holistic and lateral thinking. Um, is that yeah. your thought here too with the science curriculum? You've got to build these blocks before you start worrying about earth science and biodiversity and all that sort of stuff? Absolutely. She, she's dead right. I, I agree with her. You know, you, you're not going to understand these concepts, you know, these topics of, of infectious diseases and so on, unless you understand the basic mm. science concepts that underpin them. And, uh, you know, when you read through this draft document, you get the idea pretty easily that what they're trying to do is turn young people into activists for various causes. Now that's not the role of a science curriculum at school level. 
really young people don't know what they don't know and they have to be given the knowledge by expert teachers uh, so that they can learn to think critically. You can't think critically until you've mastered quite a lot of knowledge. Otherwise, you end up thinking poorly. Well, that aspect that you've just described then, and whenever I hear the words holistic approach, I always think, uh-uh, there's a political agenda here, or at least a philosophical one, when you think like that or express that as the reason for change. And then Kathy Bunting also saying they want to change. Is there anything wrong, though, can I ask you in your view, with the science curriculum as it stands, put aside the teaching of it and the teachers perhaps, but the curriculum itself, have you looked at it and gone, nah, it doesn't do the job? Uh, yes, I, I think it is uh, pretty lacklustre. It, it's very threadbare. It, it's not that it's got the wrong things in it, but it's, then it, there's not enough detail there to support teachers, especially at primary level. As I said before, most of those teachers have not got science degrees and their training has not prepared them particularly well to teach science. So they need a lot more support and guidance from the curriculum. But uh, what's being proposed now is not at all what they need. So in essence, your argument would be if it's not been taught through primary school, you don't have those sort of little basics coming into it. You can't strike secondary school for the first time and then you've got these quite sort of, as you say, hard concepts you've got to learn, but you've got to learn them anyhow because those are your building blocks. Um, You've got a lot of... Uh, the interesting thing to me is, and what you just said we talk, when we're talking about teaching staff, is you've got a lot of people who get a BSc or who get a science degree at university who've got a lot of other more lucrative options in the real world, either nationally or internationally, as a result of their degree. Um, what's the problem then from the Cathy Buntings of this world? Do they see science as not supporting... What? Some other agenda, do you think? Well, you'd have to ask her what, what she mm, sees I, the I role of actually, science yeah. as, as being. But, you know, t to me, science is about understanding to the best of our ability uh, the phenomena of the world. And it opens up incredible ideas and incredible uh, phenomena to, to us. You know, when we start to think about the, the vast expanse of the universe or the origins of life or the way the human brain works, these are all fascinating concepts that really stretch the imagination. And, and you know, science itself is a beautiful way of testing ideas. It's uh, rigor and it's kind of ruthless scepticism about uh, claims about the world. So, you know, a good scientist try, tries to disprove their theories, not not prove them. Mm. So that's what experiments are, are designed to do, is to, is to really falsify theories. And if you fail to do that with an experiment, then the, the theory gets stronger in, in its explanatory power. So it's quite a counterintuitive approach to testing knowledge, uh, but it's proven incredibly powerful. And that we know that because we use science to develop technology that works. And if the science was not sound, then the technology wouldn't work. So it's a method of inquiry that's taken us an awfully long way. It's improved our lives, it's lengthened our lives, and it's given us incredible understanding of the world we live in. Um, you're getting a lot of support, uh, can I say. You must be very pleased with that. I'm, uh, can I just, uh, for our listeners, can I just say that you've got support from the Association of Science Educators President, the New Zealand Institute of Physics has come out in support, um, their institute president and chairman have come out in support um, of that as well. Uh, are you gratified by the fact that science educators are very much on your side on this issue? Well, I'm pleased that they are. I'm not surprised that they are because they're scientists and they can see that if this curriculum or anything like it was to be taught in our schools, then science would be the loser. So I'm, I'm very pleased, but this isn't about me being gratified. It's about making sure that our young people get the, the science education they deserve. Mm, but uh, sometimes I've got to be honest with you, you've entered the political arena now um, by joining the initiative and by creating these political debates and discussion topics and good on you. Um, it's always nice to have people on your side, particularly when they seem to know what they're talking about. As well, you that, do. That, that's, that, that's dead right. That, that, it, it is good to have people on your side when one is trying to take on, you know, organisations like the Ministry of Education, which 
have a lot of power over our young people's educations. They do. And that's the next part I want to talk to you about. Um, since I've been involved in education, um, much more through my children, I guess, as we all are, Michael, um, we tend to get much more involved in education. I went to university, you know, after that. But suddenly when your own kids are at primary and secondary school and obviously at tertiary institutions, you start to see the world through a different pair of eyes again or at least relearn mm. stuff. Um, you seem to get the impression, and it, it's a bit of a skein here too, that the Ministry of Education are as much into indoctrinating a worldview in their curriculums as they are in providing basic learning material for children to be able to absorb. Do you pick that up? Yeah, I mean, there are shades of that. As I said before, I think the, there's an activist tone for this uh, draft curriculum. The, the idea seems to be to get young people involved in taking action. Mm. That's, that's something that's me mentioned in, in the curriculum. Now, of course, there's no, nothing wrong with young people getting passionate about causes in the world. It's, it, it's a natural thing for young people to do. But actually, they need good sound knowledge before they can make a meaningful contribution to changing the world. You know, you've got to actually get some experience and some knowledge under your belt if you want to do that effectively and move things in the right direction. Well, can so I... I, yeah, can I think I, there is a risk there. That, well, can yeah, I explore that, that concept? Is. Because you say in the curriculum, I haven't seen that as part of... I haven't seen the draft curriculum that's been leaked, you have. Is there something in there that has that imperative that is aiming to educate children in these areas for the purpose of taking some sort of political or policy action? Yes, it says something like take, taking action for the immediate future. Right. Now, okay. you know, a science education is not about taking action. It's about uh, inculcating the concepts of science. And yep. then, you know, once you've got a certain degree of expertise and knowledge, perhaps you're in a position to take action or, uh, or, or comment about the big issues of, of our times. But really... You've got to have that knowledge, and I, and I would say a university degree is the bare minimum in that regard. Indeed. Um, now, uh, uh, can I just test you on that one there too, or not test you, but just throw something in front of you. If I go back through 50 years ago through school magazines, as I have just recently because I'm writing a history of a particular school, I noticed the number of postgraduate degrees in the teaching staff, whether they're Masters of Arts or Masters of Science, um, which when I look now throughout secondary schools is absence. There are a lot of bachelor degrees and teaching diplomas, but those master's degrees, that sort of next step of postgraduate study is conspicuously missing from teaching um, staff now in comparison to 50 years ago. 50 years ago I'm talking about. Um, right. Does, does, is that another reason why there might be a lack of, um, if, you, if you like, educational, oh, I don't know, exactitude in our secondary schools, particularly for science, is that you don't have those people who are even more steeped in their subjects, who have gone deeper, who have a, um, if you like, a, a, a wider and more intense knowledge of a subject. Perhaps. Uh, I mean, I, I don't actually know the data on uh, how qualifications of teachers have changed over time very well. But again, the, there is a shortage of people even with bachelor's degrees in science and mathematics going into teaching. So schools will struggle to get specialists to teach these subjects, uh, whether they've got a bachelor's degree or master's degree. And that, that's a big issue for uh, our education system. We need the experts to be teaching the subjects if we want our young people to learn them as well as they can. Well, and, that, and I think that's the other point that's come out of this one too, Michael, is that there are plenty of people who are teaching English and social studies and, and those sorts of um, psychology is another one, um, s those social sciences in our secondary school. No shortage of those teachers. There is a great shortage of maths and science teachers. Um, is, is that, is, is there a, are there rich pickings? I mean, then that, that's the next bit. Kids these days seem to be much more acquisitive, much more aware that their education has a particular economic value in the marketplace after they leave either school or university. Um, uh, and uh, I listened to somebody that you'll know, uh, Dr. Jacqueline Roweth, I think, 
arguing that women need to spend more time or girls need to spend more time learning science because there are much better job prospects than there are learning arts at school. And she made that pitch um, to a number of secondary schools over recent years. Um, is, is there a concern that you're also not only not turning out kids who are literate in science from our schools, but a lack of children, a lack of students? Well, yes, I think science and mathematics are subjects that, unless they're taught with expertise, will leave kids behind. Uh, because, the, as I said before, there's a, there's a steep learning hierarchy in, in science and mathematics. And if you miss out on a step, then it can be really hard to catch up. Mm. So mm. it's really important when you're teaching these subjects to make sure that the, it, that each layer of knowledge is well enough learned to support the next one. And I think probably, you know, mathematics is the best example of that. And mm. if you ask a room full of adults how many of them love mathematics, you, you'd be lucky to get one or two in ten putting their hands up. Mm. So, that, and that's a shame because I think a lot of the time what's happened is that they've been left behind somewhere when they were learning at school and concluded that they were no good at it or that it, they didn't get it and and therefore don't like it. Uh, so it is. these are subjects that require not only the content knowledge to, to teach but also uh, the knowledge of how to teach them in a way that uh, is accessible and brings students along and doesn't leave them behind. Uh, and finally, um, and for our listeners, um, the New Zealand Initiative now is becoming much more involved in public issues. Who are you exactly? Uh, uh, I was trying to explain to listeners last week that I, I thought you were sort of the reconstituted business roundtable, but that's not correct, is it? You're much more than that. It's, 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 not, it's not really accurate. Uh, the, the, the initiative is a think tank, so we've got uh, about eight or, or nine research fellows, of whom I'm one. Quite a lot of us are ex-academics. We've got... Uh, Eric, who's, who's an economist, uh, he was at the University of Canterbury. Uh, James Kirstead, who's a classical studies scholar from Victoria University. We've got Matthew Birchall, who's a, a young historian. Uh, and of course, Oliver Hartwich, our, our director, he, he's, a, a, he's a legal scholar. And Bryce Wilkinson, he's a, uh, an economist as well. So. We're quite diverse in our, our uh, backgrounds and a lot of us have come out of the universities having become a bit disillusioned with how they've gone. Mm. Um, and you fund, and yes, you, our, I, our can't imagine, I can't imagine the government funds you. You get your f funding privately? No, no. Yeah, we, we, we run on a membership model, so uh, mostly businesses, but so, some individuals are members of the, of the New Zealand Initiative and, and that's how we get our funding. Uh, listen, um, and well, I, I must talk more about you because I think you're doing fantastic work. Um, this is a serious wake-up call. Uh, congratulations on exposing it, but also congratulations on the language that you've used, the argument you've used, because I think amongst science educators in New Zealand, um, there is um, outstanding support for what the issues that you're raising. Uh, well, th th thank you for having me on your show this morning. Okay, Michael, thank you very much. Nice to talk to you. All right, we're going to go to the... Um, that's Michael Johnston from the New Zealand Initiative. He was the former Associate Dean Academic of the School of Education at the University of Wellington. As he said, he left there. He was doing both jobs for a wee while, but then has transitioned. Now he's the new Senior Fellow um, at the New Zealand Initiative, and he has exposed what would appear to be um, another reason why you should be concerned about our education system and the education that our children are receiving or about to receive.